Let's dial it back to 40. So now we've got 40. <laughs> And then we don't want this um, this disembodied head. So we've messed it up again. I've got one, sorry. I don't know why I put in one. I did type in 40. There we go. Okay, so we got that. So what we do is go back to composition. So it's just the head talking. And then if we go back to the two arrows, go back to our project window, click on our project window. If we grab the face tracking MOV movie and drag it down into our timeline, we now have his body uh, and the hair and everything there, um, but we've got the face uh, distorted. Yeah. So can you re-explain like how you got this? I, I sure. Got lost a little bit. Yep. So I just took my face tracking MOV. I'll delete this too because that gets created. So this is you drag in this movie, it's in a project window, you just drag it down into our timeline. Now we can see it there. So we want to take that and we'll double click on the icon just to isolate the video. Go inside of the, the composition, grab the ellipse shape. Okay, you can grab any shape, but just because face is more more elliptical than it is square rectangular, it makes sense to use the uh, ellipse tool. Then just draw a rough shape. You can sort of create it as you're, you know, as you're as you're creating the, the, the ellipse. You can sort of change it. There you go. And then once that's there, I'm on frame one or zero rather to be able to go forward. So I'm just going to analyze. I'm going to make sure that method. It sort of snaps to this anyway, but just make sure face tracking outline is on and then go to the plus sign, which is just the analyze forward. It goes through keyframes, all of those um, vector points or anchor points rather for, um, for the ellipse tool as it's been reconfigured to match his face um, within, within a degree of accuracy, I suppose. So there we go. And then what we did is just put on any effect. There's cartoon effects, there's all sorts of things we could throw on, but this one's kind of one that we see with talking heads sometimes if someone's giving some uh, sensitive information and they don't want to reveal their face, we're going to go into effect, we'll go to stylize, we'll go to mosaic. Mosaic is basically just going to pixelate it out or create blocks out of the information. And then you go to the uh, effects over here and for mosaic, I'm going to type in 40 tab, 40 tab. Now the mosaic has been applied to it, the horizontal and vertical blocks. So now we have this talking head. Oh, I did it again. Put in a one. I don't know why that's happening. Anyway, there we go. And now we've got 40 for vertical, 40 for horizontal. And we've got the stacking of blocks. It looks very pixelated. Now we go back to composition. And all we need to do is go back to project, grab the movie again, pull it into the timeline because it will be the base element, which is the full video. And then the video sitting on top is just the face tracked version of it. So it's all blurred out. Okay? Now, that's face tracking. I've done that with a group of people in a scene, and it's actually pretty cool. You can do a lot of really fun stuff with it. And uh, um, it's, it's actually a very, does a good job of, of tracking those qualities. And then, like I say, there's the more detailed one if you want to get into facial features but that does require a little bit more processing power. Okay, so I'm gonna cancel this, or rather just close this project. Now, what if we have a video where we want to extract the character in the video, but we don't have green screen? So let's take a look at void.mov. We'll pull that into our project. Same thing, take it and drag it into our timeline. And there we go. And I'll just make it 50%, hit spacebar. So what we have is a camera that just tracks over, but there is that up and down movement. So there's a good example of maybe locking down um, the uh, X value. So track it. We don't have to do this, but we would isolate it just like we did with the arm reach. We'd isolate a high contrast point that doesn't get obscured by anything, which is going to be a challenge because this goes more or less across. But I would probably pick something in here. 
where there's contrast because that doesn't change. So maybe that point, maybe that point right there. So it starts over here on my, on my track. But look how much that moves. So uh, I might stabilize it, lock it along X so it moves left and right, but it doesn't move vertically if that's what I'm going for. We won't worry about that because we've already done that. We know how to do that. Um, but what we do want to do is we want to extract this character out of this scene and say, hey, I just want to focus on this individual. Um, and I don't want all the other stuff. And I don't have a green screen of it, and this is the video. So this is what I've, I'm left with. So this process is exactly the same process that we talked about in visual communications. When we looked at those dancers, we were talking about line, and how would you do that? Well, we'd rotoscope it. So we're going to provide, provide, perform a rotoscope of this video. So I'm just gonna move it ahead, and I'm looking for maybe a good place to start. I can start here at the beginning, I can start at the end, I can start part way. Uh, but right where there's this gap with his hat on the left-hand side as we stare at the uh, video, there's this gap, and it shows up, sort of shows up in here. So I'm gonna start there, and just say that's, that's where I'm gonna start. I might have to go back and do some additional work, that's just the nature of rotoscoping, but I wanna start where I've got the maximum amount of information. Just the same as the Reaching movie, we wanted to start our mask with the hand touching the screen, because that was the most extended that that video was gonna get in terms of that character interacting within the environment. So choose a spot along the timeline, then go up to the rotoscope brush tool, which is just the brush tool with the the person standing to the left of it up here in the, in the contextual menu in, in After Effects, click on that, and then dynamically change your uh, brush on screen. So we gotta, we, again, gotta go inside the movie, so click on void.mov, there we are. Once we see that turquoise timeline, we know we're inside the editing region of that movie. And with our rotoscope brush selected, if I hold down the control and option key, and I think it's control alt on a PC, anybody that's using a PC can yell at me and say, hey, that's right, or no, nope, you got it wrong. It might be a right click, I'm not sure. You have to let me know. Sorry, on a, on a Mac, it's option command. On a PC, I'm not sure what it is. So we're gonna just dynamically change the size of our cursor. So command, option, and just drag to the right to make it larger, drag to the left to make it smaller got yourself uh, something to work with. And then all we need to do is just quite literally swipe across the part that we want to select. And it does a fan, uh, After Effects does a fantastic job of sort of going on it. I think I know what you want to do. And then if it's not right all the way, just go in now and like a paintbrush, just go in and broad strokes and paint until all of the boy is incorporated into the um, what you're wanting out of this. And then option command, or rather I mean control option, I should say, nope, option command, um, will allow us to change the size of the brush so we can get in, select these points. That looks pretty good. Hat is all incorporated. This looks like there's some issue here grabbing some of the sky. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold down the Option key or the Alt key, it gives me the minus, and that allows me to chop away anything that's not actually accurate. And then if I did too much, just take your Option key off and away you go. Now at some point a snowflake does hit the brim of his hat and it throws this off. So it can very easily be thrown off as a result of things interacting with it, but we'll fix that if need be when we get to it. So like I say, there's this little gap here, so I do want to incorporate that as best I can. So I'm gonna zoom in, and then again, Option, Command, I'm gonna scale this down really, 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 really small. And I'm gonna hold down the Option key or the Alt key, because I wanna take this away from my selection. So I need to minus it, it's chopping away from what the what the selection is. If you want to know what the selection is, just come down to the bottom here and we can toggle to the, there's our alpha channel. That's what it's looking like. Okay, so that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And then there's more things we can do. We can get in and we can, we can, we can feather it, right? 
So we can go into the rotor brush, we can feather it. It's already at a five, because um, it probably knows by default you probably want to feather it to some extent anyway. But we can go in and we can feather it a little bit more so that it's a little less harsh when we extract it or when we, when we use other objects in behind so that it looks more natural. We do need that sort of natural feathering, which is why they've included it. Contrast is simply gonna be the contrast between white and black. So we know that a good selection is gonna be based on high contrast. The higher the degree of contrast, the better selection you're gonna have. But bear in mind that it also can produce a very hard edge pixelated object. So we, that's why it's set to 80. It's saying, hey, we know what we, want. we want high contrast, but if we're feathering along those edges, we need to allow for a little bit of that feathering. So they've got 20% allowing for that. I can shift the edge a bit. So we know we did that with our record player, negative value, positive value, negative value is gonna cut into a positive value is gonna grow out of it. And we can sort of move our selection a tiny bit on the inside so that we definitely are, are selecting our individual and we're not selecting our background. So those are there for you to sort of play around with. We can click on motion blur and it will put in a, a, a motion blur. If there's enough motion, it will add that to it. Um, you'll notice with movies nowadays, depending on your television, uh, you probably have more sophisticated television than I have, but the newer televisions um, and the way that a lot of things are filmed, their definition, the high definition is so good and so, uh, so of such high quality that a lot of that motion blur is lost because it's able to pick up detail in, in, on a frame by frame basis a lot better than it has been in the past. And so that's what you get this sort of soap opera effect, this effect of things looking a little bit phony, too crisp and too realistic um, because of that. So if you find that that's the case, just go click on uh, uh, use motion blur and then you can adjust how much motion blur you want to add to it. But that just gives it a little bit more natural movement. The, the, the eye will see movement, right? Uh, whereas a camera can pick up so much more detail than the eye can. And so we're missing that in, in some, of our, uh, some of our films these days. Um, look what happens, so in our timeline, we have, this is where I am currently, this is the current frame, it's selected, it's green, my playhead is there, but you'll notice that we have these grayed off areas and then arrows. So the arrow here is saying, we're going to the left, the arrow here is saying we're going to the right. And what that's communicating is the gray is saying we're propagating the video, uh, the, the selection that you have, such as what I have here, we're propagating that throughout the video. So it's, it's, it's building it frame by frame and those are the propagations. So if you haven't done it, you haven't gone in and masked every individual frame and, and adjusted the anchor points, you're allowing the program, based on your initial selection, you're allowing the program to make those choices for you. And that's propagation, and it does a really good job. If I hit play at this point, I shall hit I to take me back to the start, and then it just has to build it, so just give it a second, because it has to, Roto brush that across all of those frames for the whole movie. So you're seeing it propagate. You see how it's going to the left, the green. It's building each one of those sequences out. Because I hit I, it took me back to the start. So I'll play it, and there's what it looks like. And there's that little that little bit of spot, and now it's propagating the right. So it's building it all, and then it will play it. And that looks pretty good. Now the problem is it blips here. And it's just because that one spot, it recorded that, but then it didn't hold on to it. So that's okay, I'm pretty happy with how that moves. Now let's check it against the actual footage. So turn that off, that looks pretty decent. There's a little bit of a halo there. So with the halo, that's when you go in and you do your ed edge shifting with this object and you can cut into it. So as I pull, into negative values, you can see that halo. I'll, let me extend the halo to, um, to what it was there, uh, right there, 100%. Um, and then, so it's, it's pretty deliberate, right? It looks like almost like an, a GIF, where it has that hard edge out the channel. But if I take my edge, let's go to my slider, and I slide it back, it's now gonna move, it's gonna shift the edge of my selection inward, and it's gonna cut into my object eventually but that's not that big of a deal because as long as there's enough, like it's not, it's not compromising anything in terms of the hatch of the coat. And so now I've lost that halo, so it looks much more natural. So if I change my composition setting 
just as an example, I might want to put this against a different type of background. Let me just change the color so we can see it against something. So there we go. Hit play. Brilliant. And at one point, we would have had to have put a mask on this and frame by frame mask this out. I know all of you are sitting there and go, yeah, but we don't have to do that nowadays. No, you don't. Uh, and probably in a year from now, AI will just do this for you. Hey, select this and do it. Okay, done. Because uh, it will basically just run through the same algorithm that After Effects is doing to propagate this. Now, it's not perfect. So what we do need to do, and let me toggle this open, go to effects. So there's my rotor brush. So that all looks good there. And there's my propagation. So there's all sorts of key, you can keyframe, you can turn things on, you can do all sorts of things with it. Let me just make this a little larger so you can see it. There we go. So it's done a good job. Now, what I can do is say, well, I don't like this little business in here. I need that to be a bit better than it is. So I can go anywhere within the timeline, go back to my roto brush, size it to however I need it, option, command, and then I can hold down option and just you know, click in there, make this a little smaller, and go option, click, hope the click does it, does it beautifully, nice. And then I pull forward to about here, option, click, option, click, and then I sort of go back and go, does it work? Yeah, it loses it there, so I've got to do it maybe a few times. But eventually those things sort of get recognized as all part of the same. It closes, that's part of the problem, is it eventually closes and then it opens back up. So you just need to do it a few times and you've got it. So I'm just going to go down to stroke and open it up. And this background, those are all the little instances that I've gone in and clicked. Every single time you click with your roto brush, it's going to create a background, a stroke value, and it puts it in as background or foregrounds and backgrounds, depending on where, where you're clicking in terms of where you started. So we can see foregrounds, we can see backgrounds, and we can see that, so the, the minus, so plus is foreground, minus is, is the, is the, are the backgrounds. So every time you click, you're adding a new uh, stroke, uh, background or foreground to our sequence, and it's putting in keyframes. So bear that in mind, that try to get a part where there's the most amount of exposure, do the best selection you can, and then hop forward to the next point where something shifts, Probably, and, and make your changes there and, and make significant changes so that then it propagates from that point. The problem with this video is that hat, he is moving and that, that the coat and the, 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 this part of the hat is constantly moving and so it's opening and closing that hole. So we're gonna have a lot of background anyway because we're gonna constantly have to go in and cut that out but it's a very, very small little thing. You're not to manually do anything, you just are literally just going in and clicking it and the program will take care of it. But it could be a frame by frame sort of sequence for, um, for, you know, for, for 24 frames or something like that until that hat starts to move the other way. But nevertheless, no green screen and it's a clean, that's a, that's a clean um, selection with the exception of that interior part of the hat which I just need to go in and fix up. So nice, anyway, yeah. Yeah, cheer. No, I, I, I don't. Cheer, cheer, yeah, it's exciting, exciting stuff. Wow. I don't know what, you know, what kind of festival you need to go to for three days to get geared up and excited about something, but that is, that is pretty revolutionary. <laughs> um, anyway, that is it. That is uh, all we're going to do in After Effects. Um, just a couple things that you can get in and start working with. If you're working with video, you might need to extract some things like an individual or a car or something like that. Those are a couple ways of doing it. If you're gonna work with green screen, again, I encourage you, we have a green screen sheet here. It's fairly large for larger green screen things that you might need to do. Um, but if you wanna just do small stuff like wrapping a bottle or 
covering the table, and then you can do all sorts of cool things on that table top because it no longer exists and it could become a TV. So I've done it where you've done, I've done desks and, and walls and you green screen them and you just make television screens out of them. It's just, a, it's just a tele, it's just a screen and you play different videos on it. Kind of like uh, if you've ever seen a uh, uh, Tom Cruise movie um, and they, they, they don't have crime because they can anticipate the guy, I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, you probably don't, haven't even seen it. So it's, beyond your time but uh, anyway there's all sorts of that stuff going on in that movie and that's partly maybe how they did that but if you want a good green screen just go to the dollar store a couple sheets at dollar store they're they're nice large sheets they're an acid green they are perfect for green screening and you can green screen any surface and then it's gone it's just out of your out of your shot and you can replace it with something else so you could wrap this in a green screen and have a commercial and then you just replace this green screen with your actual 3D model, okay? If you want to do that. So there we are. That is uh, all we're gonna do. Next week, we're gonna finish up our animation uh, unit with some, just some smaller stuff, get into after, uh, get into Photoshop, we're gonna look at WebP and animated GIFs and things like that, and that will finish off our term, and then the week after that is our graded feedback session. Checkpoint.